Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I am excited to introduce this virtual event with Dr. Peter Fisher discussing his book, What is Dark Matter, in conversation with Dr. Melissa Franklin. Thank you for joining us virtually. Today's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. On Thursday, November 10th, Dr. Peter Pesek, director of the Science Institute at St. John's College, Santa Fe, will join us virtually for a discussion of his latest book, Sounding Bodies, Music and the Making of Biomedical Science. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our author at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. And finally, in the chat, I will be posting a link to purchase what is dark matter on harvard.com. Thank you to our partners at Harvard University, and thank you all for showing up, supporting us, and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, indie book selling, and especially for science. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Peter Fisher is the Thomas A. Frank Professor of Physics and currently serves as head of the Office of Research, Computing, and Data at MIT. He has served as a referee for several journals, as well as editor of, for the International Journal of Physics and Modern Physics Letters. He carried out one of the first dark matter searches and since then has searched for dark matter on Earth and in space, including inventing a new kind of detector, the dark matter time projection chamber. Tonight, he is joined in conversation by Professor Melissa Franklin, the Malincott Professor of Physics and Director of Graduate Studies at Harvard University, where she is presently searching for new physics beyond the standard model. Tonight, Peter and Melissa have joined us for a discussion of what is dark matter. Peter's latest report on the current state of the dark matter problem, which one caller of the University of Chicago calls accessible to any curious reader. It will benefit those that desire to go a bit more technically in depth into the subject matter filled with anecdotes. This cohesive and fluid book is a great invitation to learn more. We have a lot to cover this evening. So without further ado, I am delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is all yours, Peter. Hello. Hello, Melissa. How are you? Hi, hi, hi. So good to be here. I enjoyed reading your book and it was very fun. And I learned Thank a you. lot. Yeah. Thank you. It was, it, there were moments it was fun to write but it was uh, also a lot of work. I hear only 10 years. <laughs> it, was, it was 10 years, yeah. Not continuously. I did some things in between. Um, so I was just going to show some slides to kind of set the scene, and then we can talk about, about things a little bit. Sounds perfect. OK, so. You know, here's here's the bottom line up front, which is the title of the book is "What Is Dark Matter." Um, you know, this this was the title Princeton University Press assigned to me. They have a series of books, "What Is Blank," so I just slotted into that. But you know, the the answer is that we we don't know. We don't know really whether part of, uh, dark matter is a particle a heavy particle, it could be a light particle, it could be little tiny black holes from the beginning of the universe, or it could be something we haven't even thought of. Thought of. Um, so, you know, kind of that said, the, the questions I, I'd like to uh, try to say something about is how do we know there is dark matter? And why is dark matter so hard to find? And I'll just say that dark matter first made its appearance arguably in 1985. And uh, so that was almost 40 years ago. And despite, you know, 35 efforts on, on the part of me and many, many other people, uh, dark matter has not been um, observed in a way that we can say what it actually is. Uh, and and so I, I'd like to try to communicate why that that is so so difficult. We're we're we've been diligent. We're not lazy. Um, we haven't been wasting time, but um, we we haven't succeeded. Um, so I'll put some slides up. These are pictures, and I have seven. I always like to say how many slides because people want to know if there's seven or seventy-seven. Um, 
So just give me a second here. Um, hang on, there's a little noise in my house. Hey guys, a little more quiet, please. My wife and daughter are, are having an animated conversation while they are making dinner. Um, they could be attending my talk, but there. Okay. So. Okay, uh, so Melissa, are you are you seeing the slides okay? Yep, I see them, it looks great. Okay, so what is dark matter? Um, this first slide encapsulates a um, hundred years of, of very um, difficult scientific work with an unexpected outcome. So in the last hundred years, a little bit more than a hundred years, um, Astronomers and, and particle physicists uh, worked kind of side by side, but, but parallel play, not, not together. And so let me summarize the first the last hundred years of particle physics. Um, quantum mechanics was invented in the 1930s. And then uh, the theory was developed so that we understood how atoms and, and some things about nuclei worked in the 30s and 40s. And then 1950s, with this wonderful tool called quantum field theory, there was just this explosion of, of understanding. Um, the post-war era brought accelerators and uh, new kinds of particle detectors and lots of particles were discovered and theoretical work was, a lot of theoretical work was done. And then in the seventies and eighties, um, a, a real consistent picture of three different kinds of interactions between particles the electromagnetic interaction, the weak interaction, the strong interaction emerged, and they were put together in one frame, framework, which is called the standard model. And in the 1990s, uh, when, when I was became active in the field, uh, we were testing the standard model and finding the last few particles. And that concluded in, in 2012 with the discovery of the Higgs boson. So now we have a theory with uh, 17 particles. We know all of the interactions between them. The interaction strengths have been measured. All the particles' properties have been measured pretty well. There's still some work to do. Um, and in the late 1990s, we thought this was just great that um, we, we had figured out everything about everything. That wasn't true. So going back, into the 1920s, that was the era of the first large telescopes, and this part's about astronomy. And astronomers uh, used these telescopes and, and began wondering whether these fuzzy stars were uh, that they observed were um, balls of gas inside of our Milky Way galaxy. That was one school of thought or whether there were other galaxies outside of the Milky Way that were very, very far away millions of light years away. And in the mid-1920s, uh, Hubble, uh, one of one of astronomers that the telescope is named after, showed that, that in fact these nebulae were actually different galaxies that were uh, millions of light years away from, from Earth. And then uh, shortly thereafter found that they were all moving away from the Earth, which meant that the universe was expanding, which is actually something that Einstein's theory predicted. Uh, and then through subsequent years, astronomers, they did a lot of things. They're very busy people. Um, they studied the way galaxies moved with respect to each other and the way stars moved within galaxies. And the only way they could come up with explaining how everything was moving in the biggest scales of the universe was the introduction of matter that we couldn't see. And there were actually two kinds of matter that we, we couldn't see. One got the name dark energy and that 
makes the universe as a whole expand more quickly than uh, we expected based on Einstein's original theory. And the other was dark matter. And dark matter makes particles or um, stars within galaxies move more quickly than you'd expect from the mass in those galaxies. Um, and they arrived at the end of 19, the 1990s with this pie chart. Um, people like me had been, and Melissa, Melissa played a big part in all of this. We had been studying the, the little section of the pie chart, which is 4%, which is called stuff we know about. And that's atoms and molecules and DNA and water and air and cats and everything. And then uh, the other 96% were these new substances. And I always find this an interesting thing to talk to uh, people about because is this is this success or failure? We we thought we knew everything uh, as particle physicists, and and some were very arrogant about it, uh, including me. Um, and then astronomers come along and say, "Nah, you know, you you don't know, you don't know ninety six percent of of what's going on." So the dark matter is is what I'm interested in, and I can say more about dark energy and and maybe why I'm not so interested in it if somebody wants to ask a question, but we're gonna talk about dark matter because dark matter could be a particle that we don't know about, or it could be little black holes, or it could be um, some particle that's been predicted by one of the many theories that have, have come about. So let me just tell you a little bit more about how dark matter works. Um, let's see. I've somehow lost my cursor. Hang on a second. Okay, this is a picture of the galaxy Andromeda. It's the closest galaxy to the Milky Way. And it is about 2 million uh, light years away. And it looks very similar to the Milky Way. And in the middle, you can see this glowing region. Uh, in the very middle of that, there's a, a big black hole, about a million times the mass of our sun. And uh, there's a lot of matter being pulled in to the dense central region. And then you can see there's kind of this beautiful pancake shape with spiral arms that looks kind of cloudy, cloudy. It's not really cloudy, those are all stars. And there are about a trillion stars in this picture. What's particularly interesting is you can, you can see that there's kind of a sharp end to the disk part or the pancake part that, that, that I mentioned. And that is that shape and that edge is, is really only explainable if you hypothesize that there is some substance called dark matter that is making a gravitational field that makes that shape. You can't make that shape using just the gravity from the stars. Uh, it really requires that there be this large diffused sphere of, of dark matter surrounding uh, the, the galaxy and extending actually many, many times the radius out, out to the side. We can um, use telescopes, astronomers can use telescopes to measure how fast these stars move. And in fact, the stars all orbit the bright central region and they go around once every 200 million years. And measuring the velocity, it turns out that the stars are moving a lot more quickly than one would expect from the gravitational force of just the stars. So this is really saying that there is some substance in this huge structure. And I'll tell you, this is about 50,000 light years across um, that is not seen. And not seen means it's not creating light because the only way we can detect something in a distant galaxy is by the, the light that's created. So instead of this really being the, the scientist's picture of, of a galaxy, the theoretical picture of a galaxy really is like this, where in the middle, 
you can see um, the disk where there are dark matter and, and baryons is the fancy name for all the stuff we know about. Um, you can see I've marked that our solar system in the Milky Way is about halfway out of this disk. And then around it is a spherical halo of uh, dark matter um, that there's about 10 times as much dark matter as the rest of the matter in, in the galaxy. And it's making the right kind of gravitational field for the galaxy to have this, this really quite remarkable, beautiful uh, disk shape with uh, the spiral arms. So this is actually a really remarkable picture. This is a picture of many, 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 many galaxies. And this was a picture that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And it's called the Extremely Deep Field. And what they did uh, with Hubble was really quite remarkable. Um, this is a telescope that's in orbit, so it can take um, very high resolution, very precise pictures. And one of the major projects that they carried on over the two decades, or three decades now that it's been in orbit, is to take a picture with a very, very long exposure of the darkest part of the sky. So this is a picture of the Fornax constellation. And everything you see in this picture, almost, except for one or two objects, is a galaxy. And you can see they have all kinds of different shapes and colors. Uh, and some are big and some are small. And some of them are just barely one pixel on your screen, um, barely visible. And that's a galaxy of a trillion stars on the other side of the universe. So this is to give you some idea of just the plethora of different shapes and sizes. And a careful study of all these different kinds of galaxies always comes up with the same conclusion, which is that the stars are moving too fast to be explainable by the amount of light coming from that galaxy. And the, um, and this must denote the presence of dark matter around all galaxies. And this is, uh, there have been very detailed measurements of literally thousands of galaxies, and they all show these features. So dark matter is really something that's, that's, that's pervasive. Now, you might think, well, what's the big deal? Maybe dark matter is just, uh, just a kind of another, another kind of particle, and there are lots of particles, so what are you worried about? Well, actually, this is, these are all the particles that we know about. Um, in the green are quarks, and these are particles that make up nuclei. Uh, in the purple are uh, the electron and its, its cousins, and below the electron are the neutrinos, uh, which are the other cousins of the electron. Um, the, the cyan down the right side are all the different particles that make forces and uh, hold things together or cause things to decay. And um, then off to the very right there is the Higgs boson, which is the particle whose interaction makes, makes mass for all these other particles. It makes them heavy. And I'll just mention that, that uh, my, my interlocutor, uh, Melissa Franklin, played a really important role in discovering two of these, the top quark and the Higgs boson, and maybe one I don't know about. But the thing about this is there are these 17 particles and there's a, a theory, which is a set of rules. And I'll tell you, you could write down the rules. The rules for the standard model, how all of these things are interact, interact are about as complicated as the rules for bridge. You know, it's not simple, but it's not real hard. And, and if you wanted to, most people can, can figure it out. The other thing though, that's quite remarkable and important is that this theory is complete and there's no room for anything else in this theory. We could add something to the theory, but that would be a, an enormous change. And it would mean that new particles would have to be discovered or new interactions would have to be discovered. But as this stands, these 17 particles and the rules that tell us how they talk to each other doesn't have room for anything that could be dark matter. 
and that's just where we are. Um, so let me show you one more picture. This is a picture of the sky that's kind of been unrolled into an oval. So looking straight up is the center of the oval and looking straight down is, is kind of the whole edge of the oval. And this is a map of the temperature of the night sky with all of the stars and all the galaxies subtracted out. And that leaves just the light from the Big Bang. And the Big Bang happened 13.8 um, billion years ago. And when the Big Bang happened, uh, about 400,000 years later, um, at the formation of neutral hydrogen, uh, light was released. And the light had slightly different temperatures depending on where it came from. And in 1963, this light was, was first observed. It's called, called the cosmic microwave background. And since then, it's been carefully mapped. So this is a map of the temperature of the sky. And the average temperature is about three degrees Celsius above absolute zero. But it's not the same other, other places. And the reason it's not the same at all places is that some places there was a little bit more dark matter and some places there was a little bit less. And on this, um, on this map, the places where it's red, there was a little bit more. And the places where it was blue, there was a little bit less. And these variations were caused by quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics has uncertainty. So if you have... Uh, some matter uniformly filling the universe. The density isn't the same every place. It's different and it changes just quantum mechanically. And so by looking at this, we can figure out the size of, of galaxies and something about how they formed just from the quantum mechanics of, of dark matter. And again, this is an astronomy picture and the picture is consistent with there being about 23% of the matter energy in our universe being dark matter compared to 4% of, of the, the stuff we know about. So those are really three examples of why we know there's dark matter. There are many, many others. Most of them come from astronomy or all they all come from astronomy. Um, and it's pretty much inarguable that there is something in the universe that's filling the universe beyond the, the, the stuff that we've been studying uh, here on Earth. So that's how we know there is dark matter. Um, I'll just tell you, um, I'm going to stop sharing, if I may. Is that okay, Melissa? Yep, yep, yep. Okay. <clears throat> Great. Okay, and I'll just tell you why it's hard to find. And, and I have a little audiovisual aid for this. This is a little box that I made. And there's, there's one theory of dark matter, which um, I sort of like, and I studied for a long time, but I got tired of it, but it's called the WIMP theory, weakly interacting massive particle. If that theory is correct, there is one dark matter particle in this box. And the reason it's hard to find dark matter is okay, there's a particle in this box, but there's a billion, billion, million protons in this box. And there's three billion, billion, million electrons in this box. And there's a couple of muons, and there are a whole bunch of other things in this box. So here on Earth, it's hard to find dark matter because there's so much normal matter around that. When, when Melissa and I do experiments, all we're doing is sorting particles. And inevitably you make mistakes. And if you make a mistake 1% of the time, that means if you sort 100 particles, one of them you're gonna get wrong. To find dark matter on earth, you have to sort a billion, billion, million particles and not make a mistake. And, and that's, that's really difficult. Um, the size of a galaxy though, there's 10 times more dark matter than there is normal matter. So that's why it's an astronomy problem. You have to look at look and think about galaxies as a whole. 
in order to to find dark matter. Anyway. So, so when you say so when you say there's a one dark matter in that box at any one time, there's yeah. is it moving through? Oh yeah, they, it comes and goes, you know. It, and if it's okay. if it if it's primordial black hole, it's it's much less frequent. But yeah, but on average, there's one one wimp. 100 GeV wimp is is in this box right now, uh, and also you know a few in your head. Think about that. Yeah, I think about that all the time. Um, great. So you you actually um, are making clear how hard the problem is, and people have been working incredibly hard. And you talk about all this in your book. I just want to uh, talk briefly about this uh, series of books called Princeton Frontiers in Physics, which this is part of. There's some other books like um, How Do You Find an Exoplanet or Can the Laws of Physics Be Unified? And it's kind of an interesting series because mm -hmm. it's, it's perfect for somebody, it, it, it's good for many people, but it's perfect for somebody who's had some physics education and then wants to know what's happening in in the field at any one time and i think i mean, i learned a lot from it and i i'm not just a person who knows a little bit of physics but i think an undergraduate after taking quantum mechanics it would be perfect for and then even for somebody who who doesn't have any physics there's something you can get out of it i i i like the way you started when you said um, if you have ghosts in your house moving things around you can't see them or hear them or anything or feel them um, but the objects in your house get started to get moved around in weird ways and so all you want to do is figure out from from the movements of the things what exactly is going on and this is this was your analogy for dark matter um, affecting yeah. how we, the matter we see moves around i thought that was very nice um, but i i'm hoping the ghosts are not scary well, it's creepy. I mean, it's creepy in our universe, isn't it? That there's all this stuff there and it's always been there. And it, it took us like 5,000 years to realize it. That's, uh, you know, what, el what else are we missing? What, what else are we missing? Yeah. I yeah. Um, um, so so I guess, I guess uh, one of the really interesting things, and you mentioned this already, is that in, you, you go through the, the early universe in this book and you sort of say... Uh, what happened. And, and you say, you know, we have this great standard model, but the standard model is only three of the four forces uh, that exist. We, we don't have a standard model for gravity. We don't have a quantum theory of gravity. And yet at yeah. the, in the very beginning of the universe, you say, it's got to be quantum mechanical. I mean, it's very tiny and high energy. Yeah. And we don't have any theory. And that there's all these things that might have happened that we can only tell from the from the light we see now, the cosmic microwave background that you talked about. So can you talk about that a little bit? Because you, you write something really nice. You say the cosmic microwave background carries the imprint of quantum mechanical variations in the density of dark matter at the time of hydrogen formation. So that's after the universe has inflated and I just want, wondered if you could tell a little bit about that story. Well, yeah, I mean, it, the, the, well, well, I'll just put a plug in for a, a much better book than mine called The First Three Minutes by, by, by Steven Weinberg, who explains this in, in, in great detail. The thing I find mar remarkable about the, the picture that I showed is that um, you're really with, um, undergraduate quantum mechanics, you, you learn enough so that you, you can see that that picture has to be quantum mechanical. It, it has to be the product of, of some quantum mechanical uh, system, by, by which I mean quantum mechanics, you're, you're really seeing quantum mechanics when you're seeing the fluctuations, the, the things changing. And you people, uh, you know, if you want to think about a fluctuation, um, go, um, if, if, you, if you have a top loading washing machine, uh, you know, start it and, and open the lid and then put your finger on the little button to hold it down so that your 
washing machine is running and you'll see the spindle going back and forth and you see the water sloshing around. And every once in a while you'll see water kind of come bloop and there'll be like a drop that hangs there for an instant and then falls back in. That's like a quantum mechanical fluctuation. It's, it's, it's something that appears and then disappears in some very random, random process. So at this time, you know, before the, the light from the Big Bang, in this time, this very, very early before much matter had formed, this dark matter is just roiling around. And, and every once in a while, there's kind of this bloop of, of a much denser region, and then it, it disappears. And, and the, the imprint is just a snapshot it's of of one of those instances where you can see a few of the little blips and and uh, and and not others. Um, it's a little bit. I was trying to an, an analogy that I didn't use making the book is it's like suppose you took a a, um, a picture of the surface of a swimming pool five minutes after some number of children had gotten out of the pool. So you you know you'd still see some rippling around, and could could you figure out how many kids had been in the pool, or maybe they were ghosts, and... or maybe they were ghosts. <laughs> yeah. Um. So uh, I was also interested. Uh, I mean, I'm interested in everything. You talk about this idea that I haven't really thought about before, which is that just after the universe it, it just started, it, it, inflation happened. We don't know if inflation actually happens, but let's imagine inflation happens. Then just after you say there, there's possibility that there's some very heavy mass primordial particles. Yeah. I have no idea what they are. Um, that then decay, and uh, you know it makes you think really like <laughs> what, what were they? I, like I want to know what those are. And um, so do those I. aren't in the regular. Those aren't in Weinberg's first three minutes. I think. No, no, he was. He... He was a very circumspect man. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just say anything, but he was very careful. Yeah. So, are so tell me, tell me, are those just something that you like to think about, or are they something you think might be real? Well, I mean, so you you know you know you've worked at colliders like I have, and and and, and you know that that there's this kind of hierarchy. You you have this big accelerator, it, it knocks two protons together, and the two protons make something very heavy, like two top quarks, which weigh about 200 times a proton. And then the top quark decays to a lighter quark, and then the lighter quark decays to an even lighter quark, and then that decays to some photons. And you, you know, there's this, there's just this cascade down to the lightest particles that are that are around. And uh, one just naturally imagines that in the early universe, we see the first part of that cascade, which is, uh, you know, it, although it's kind of going backwards, it's 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 a formation. Um, and, and you kind of, you know, we kind of see uh, the, you know, protons forming and then deuterons, you know, heavier and heavier particles are getting built up. And where did all of this come, come from? It's natural to think it came of the, from the decay of something, or but you know maybe it was maybe it was a soup of really light particles that all got pushed together and made made heavier particles. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't know either. But it was an interesting idea. Um, yeah, I, I it made me think that you know maybe there was some some something to look forward to when we were able to get the collider <laughs> collider up to an energy. You know maybe you know. Yeah, well, I'll, that, that I'll be, be a ghost by then, but <laughs> yeah. Um, so the other thing that I found really interesting, you talk a lot about how um, this man's, this scientist's wiki in the 20s or 30s first saw the a little bit of evidence for dark matter, but the instruments he had to actually measure things weren't so precise. And so it wasn't until sort of 1970 when um, when Vera Rubin and Kent Ford realized that they could go back to this problem with yeah. better instruments. 
And I thought that was really interesting because that happens a lot in science. Yeah. And, um, but still it takes, it takes some kind of, it's like a, a little bit of brilliance to realize what you can go back and do at a time. Because so, you know, you say that, you know, dark matter, the idea of dark matter really became prominent in the eighties. And that was after they had used better equipment that they made, right. To, to map out um, the dark matter in all of these different galaxies. Is that sort of the story that you would tell? Yeah, well, I mean, so all of this, I mean, all of this is driven by technological uh, advance. You know, Zwicky made his observations on Mount Wilson in a little observatory next to the 100 inch Mount Wilson telescope. And, and, and so on the Mount Wilson telescope, you know, all the other astronomies, you know, Walter Body and all those guys, you know, they're clawing each other's eyes out to look through the big telescope. He just went to town on this little Schmidt telescope that was only 18 inches, but it had a very wide field of view. So he could get this whole system of galaxies in one frame. And so that he could measure their velocities and their positions very accurately. Um, and and that's where his original observations of of, of dark matter came from. I, I and, and and you know he 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 wrote this incredible paper, which I'm sure you know all about uh, about exactly you know this this topic. Uh, he was an awful man, by the way. Uh, no, nobody nobody liked him because he was very mean to people. Um, I tell my students about this because you know it just doesn't pay. Um, it doesn't pay to be mean to people unnecessarily. Oh. Hang um, on, no, I'm, I'm going to get a power cord. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. Uh, my my computer's telling me it's about to run out of batteries, and it's making me really nervous. Probably so. Go. So. Uh, so in this book, so there's so many things I want to ask you actually, but in this book, you go through all the possible uh, candidates that could be dark matter. And you say that, um, so first of all, you say, you know, how do we know there's dark matter? And you go through all the evidence for that. And then you say, you know, okay, how are we going to figure out what it is? How are we going to figure out how, who these ghosts are and what they're doing? Um, and you go through like primordial black holes. And, you know, the first thing I think you talk about is, you know, failed stars. And I realized immediately I didn't know what a failed star was. So I had to look in the glossary, which is very good in this book. Um, yep. and, and, uh, and to find out what that was. And then there was possibility that it's um, some kind of beyond the standard model particle that we would have to add to the standard model. Um, and there was, there was the fact that maybe gravity is different than we think it is. Um, yeah. Um, and I guess um, it really, really interesting. It's really interesting to read uh, all is everything about the new detectors and all. It's pretty up to date. So you must have just finished it recently. Um, July. Was, yeah. You know, it could be axions, uh, which are other particles. Um, that we, we don't know whether they exist or not. So it's kind of exciting. And I thought that um, you say at one point, you say for this one detector to measure axions, the amount of power that this um, experiment is able to detect is about the same as that entering your eye from a hundred watt bulb, 20 million kilometers away. Yeah. And that's kind of like, it's so exciting. So in all of this story, what you get from this book is that a lot of people have been doing a lot of experiments in very smart ways with very yeah. good detectors and to figure this out. And, and we haven't figured it out yet, but it's incredibly exciting. I just wondered whether you're feeling that. Well, that's what drew me to it. Um, you know, the, the, the big experiments at accelerators are, 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 you know, they're really exciting because the level of technology is so high, but it's all known technology because by the time you build one of those things, you have to be sure that it's going to work. And the dark matter was, you know, experimentally, it's kind of the wild west. You know, you have all the, I mean, and you know, lots of dark matter people, they're all 
like kind of wacko. Um, and 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 they do really extreme things. I mean, we we did experiments way far underground to be away from cosmic rays. We built an experiment that's sitting on the space station now, which was you know absolutely hell to to do. Um, and and there are all these really kind of extreme detectors, like you know being able to measure ten to the minus twenty four watts uh, of 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 power, which is, you know, phenomenal that those experiments are able, able to do that. Um, and you're just driven to think about these things because uh, uh, really it's this sorting problem. It's this one in a billion, billion, million, you, you know, you have to have something really weird and different and new uh, to be able to get at that. So, so, okay. I have two more questions before we're going to questions from the audience. Um, and I have exactly zero minutes, so I'll ask them very fast, okay? Okay. One is, uh, I wanna know what you think um, is the most likely candidate. That's just, <laughs> but, no. but the other thing I'm, I'm a little worried about is, um, can you talk about, uh, imagine that dark matter doesn't have any other interactions other than gravity. So yeah. you just have gravity. So a lot of these experiments are not gonna work. Yeah. And um, is that a possibility? So first of all, absolutely, you know, do you think absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It, okay, it, can you it, tell it, us a little bit about that? Well, I mean, it 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 could be exactly what you say that none of these experiments, none of my experiments, worked in in the sense they didn't find dark matter. Um, they set limits and they got students PhDs and things like that. Um, but I mean, there one of the and I know you know this, one of the hard things about science is there's no guarantee of, of success. I mean, you set your sights on something and you, you know maybe you discover something or, or, or maybe not. I think one of the key things about it is, is, is really just the, the journey or the quest. And um, I've been fortunate that I've, I've worked with mostly people I really liked and respected trying to do these really hard things. And, um, you, you know, we've, we've kind of moved each other forward in our lives. And, and, and that's, you know, that's really why we do this. And uh, uh, you're director of graduate education. So you obviously know, and I know you know, the, the great joy in, in teaching a graduate student something and learning from them. Yeah, because one of the one of the things most people don't realize is the professors learn as much as the students do. You know, because students come with, you know, they say all kinds of things, and if you're paying attention, you think about some of them, and you really learn something. Um, the The first question, you know, what I if if I could choose what dark matter was, I I'd choose primordial black holes. I really like primordial black holes. And these are but, black holes. Sorry, in the book you say it's almost impossible to see them. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm thinking. I spend a lot of time thinking about how to find them. And uh, you know, uh, there, there have been some great exper experiments. You know, by by uh, people from Harvard even uh, looking for versions of primordial black holes. And and. Uh, I, I think it's a place I want to go to next. Um, I like it because you, you know you don't need any more theory to explain them because you've already have gravity and presumably gravity knows how to do that and you don't need to add anything to the standard model. So that's all set. We don't have to mess with that because you know any change to the standard model is just going to be a mess. It's going to be really inconvenient. Um, we'll have to learn <laughs> things again. <laughs> Okay, primordial black holes, which are just black holes that are made in the early universe and so, very so, small. So, oh, could so, you see how big they are? Yeah, so black holes have this special place, special radius called the event horizon. And once you cross the event horizon, you can't come back out. So the the lightest uh, a black hole that would still be in the universe can be is um, about the mass of a comet. 
And the event horizon on, on a black hole from the beginning of the universe with about the mass of a comet would be a little bit less than the radius of a proton. So, you know, tiny. And um, they could just go straight through Earth. They don't pick up much matter. Um, they can go straight through pretty much anything and nobody really notices. They're, they're really pretty cool. And, you, you know, it's just such a simple thing. And, you know, Hawking, Stephen Hawking is famous because of this paper about black hole evaporation. That paper was written to explain why there weren't more primordial black holes in the universe. So if you look at the 1972 Hawking radiation paper, which he's famous for, because that's the one place where we see quantum mechanics and gravity coexist, there's two references in that paper. One is to Joe Weber, mm -hmm. and the other is to a previous paper he wrote calculating the density of primary primordial black holes, and it was much too high. And so we had to figure out some way of getting rid of them. Interesting. So I, I just think that I think they're really cool. They're really simple. You don't have to learn a bunch of new theory or anything. They're just pretty hard to find, but pretty hard to find. Okay. So that's what you're going to be working on in the next 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You, you want to help? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I'll come. Yeah. So um, okay. uh, Benjamin, Benjamin Quinn, I think it's time for us to have uh, questions from the audience. I, I, I hope I haven't asked all the questions. Uh, you certainly haven't, Melissa. There are quite a few in the queue, so let me work my way through them. Okay, so Peter, when you started by saying that you weren't going to talk about dark energy, um, people immediately wrote with some questions. So I'm going to ask one that I think summarizes all of them. So okay. um, Carlos Castro asks, how do we know that what we... Oh, so sorry, reading the wrong question. Stephen Katona, sorry, Stephen, says, since matter and energy are intimately related, can you speculate on possible relations between dark matter and dark energy? Yeah, I mean, they're pretty different. Um, so the, the thing about Einstein's theory of gravity is there's this one equation. And the one equation relates the, the way this universe bends and expands to the matter content, the matter and energy content of, of the universe. So if you know the matter and energy content, you can tell how the, how the universe is going to change. All dark energy is, is the addition of one number to that equation. And it explains everything we observe about dark energy. Um, so that's why I, I, first of all, I'm not terribly interested. We've measured, or not me, but astronomers have measured that one number. They now know it to a few percent, and that's dark energy. Um, dark dark matter is is really explainable by a new kind of particle with all the messiness that particles bring. So there isn't a simple relationship. I think many of us believe that there's kind of a theory of everything or, you know, some unified theory, and they would be related in that theory, but we don't know what that theory is. So we have gravity and we have everything else and uh, sort of dark energy is over here in the gravity part and everything else is over here in the everything else part. I mean, dark dark matter is over <laughs> everything else part. Great, thank you. So now I will ask some questions about dark matter and the speculation. So Bill Bloomberg asks, thanks for a superb talk. Can you comment on the theories that the effects of what we call dark matter is actually the consequence of not understanding gravity on very large physical scales? Yeah, so that, that was one of the most interesting things about the book was that was an area that I hadn't really followed and I did a lot of reading about it. And after a while, I kind of began to believe in it. Um, it, it I showed two pictures from two different telescopes. One was, was Andromeda and, and you can see the effects of dark matter there and Andromeda 
kind of the characteristic size of Andromeda is, let's say, 50,000 light years. Dark matter explains the same features in the picture of the light from the Big Bang. And the size of that picture is, is kind of 14 billion light years. And so it's I, I one reason I chose those two is the very different scales, 50,000 light years and 14 billion light years, are explainable by the same particle phenomenon. And I don't think anyone's found a way to really do that by just modifying gravitational field. You can choose. I mean, and what people have done is they've been able to explain the way Andromeda looks by changing gravity. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. But then when you look at well, what's the constant consequence of the light from the Big Bang, it doesn't work out. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to move on to this next question, um, which is sort of about technology. And I'm interested to sort of hear about your experience with the technology used for this. So interesting kind of analogy. So Cameron Clayton asks, UFOs are often just the result of the device used to view them. Is it possible how we make the measurements might cause us to overestimate the role of dark matter? And so I guess just a question about technology. Yeah, no, that's... <laughs> Yeah, you know, every every observing system brings what we call and uh, you know, just just on UFOs, um, in 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 the early part of the Cold War, uh, the United States built a line of radar stations along the Arctic Circle called the Distant Early Warning Line, and and these were big radars, and they were looking over the North Pole where we were expecting if 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 the Soviet Union ever attacked, there'd be planes coming over the, and, and, and so there were 20 or so of these stations running 24 seven with operators just staring at these displays. They, oh, 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 so no. oh gosh. Oh, I guess uh, yeah, I bet he didn't uh, plug in his uh, power uh, cord. Oh gosh, okay. Uh, um, uh, so, well, no, well, he, I'm sure he's going to come back. Um, what do you think? I think, I, I think he will as well. I think he will figure out, um, the question. So uh, let's... in the meantime, in the meantime, um, I can just say that there's a couple of other things in this book that are really nice in case you haven't, um, decided to buy it yet. Um, but one of the nice things he talks about is, um, if dark matter annihilates uh, somewhere up in up in the sky, um, about the magnetic fields that are outside the atmosphere, the magnetic fields, you know, there's an Earth magnetic field and magnetic fields out. Ah, oh, there he is outside the there atmosphere. He is. <laughs> I, was, I was filling in for you and telling them your story about beautiful magnetic fields outside our our atmosphere and how the uh, dark matter annihilations were going to. Um, send electrons and positrons along those. But I was just filling in you, uh, because you didn't plug in your power, right? Well, no, there are other problems, but yeah, I'm, oh, okay. I'm here. I'm okay. here now. I'm sorry. And you're anyway, back. <laughs> so these radar operators saw all kinds of stuff that it it took years to explain. And you know, this is where a lot of the original UFO lore. Uh, came from. So it's always interesting anytime you build, uh, you know, a, a, a new device, you see things you don't expect and, 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 and until you know what they are, they're unidentified. So um, to answer the question specifically, um, that is a great question. And, and if you look in optical telescopes enough, you can see all kinds of of, of weird artifacts that are just features of the optics of, of, of the observing system. Um, the key thing is that the all of the measurements are made repeatedly using very different kinds of telescopes. So the measurements, for example, I talked about how fast the stars move in the galaxy Andromeda. Those were made with large optical telescopes and also with radio telescopes you know, very, very different. And uh, it, it's not a guarantee, but 
it gives one confidence that the same overall effect is observed in two you know, very different things, one that's looking at light and the other that's looking at radio waves and they're on different parts of the earth and they operate in very different ways. So it's really repeated observations using several different kinds of technologies. But that's a, that's a great question and it's always something to, to press scientists on because um, you know, people do get, get stuck on, on what they do. Um, and, and there's always the danger of believing it too much. Mm -hmm. but, but sorry, uh, sorry, Peter, in your, in your book, you discuss many different ways that we know dark matter is there from gravitational lensing to also looking at the rotation, the, how fast the stars yeah. move. So yeah. it's not just so one. Yeah, it's one phenomenon viewed many different ways, and then many different phenomena viewed optically. It's it's a people have been busy. I was you know, I I, I mean I thought when I first started writing the book, uh, I, I thought I you know this would really be about particle physics, but it turned out it's mostly about astronomy, and I'm not an astronomer. So I'm going to ask. One more technical question, and then we're going to end with a discussion of literature because we've gotten a few book questions. But I want to ask this question from Sasha von Meyer, who asks, can you talk about the scale of the in homogeneity of the background radiation? It seems so much larger than what you'd think of in quantum mechanics. Oh, can, can, can you put that picture back? Because you didn't point out the micro Kelvin. Yeah. Um, I think that might have been. I think this is going to be, I'm, I'm, I'm on right. my... Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Anyhow, the, the scale, right, was micro Kelvin. So. Yeah, so the, the average temperature is, uh, and, and hello to Sasha, who's uh, from out at Berkeley and, and an expert on the electrical grid. Um, the um, microwave sky average temperature is about three degrees, 2.7 degrees. And, and the variations are on, you know, hundreds of, well, hundreds of micro Kelvin. So a, a, a less than a thousandth of a degree Kelvin. And um, you can put in the conditions of, 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 of the emission of the microwave background and then propagate backwards in time. And you get a temperature that kind of makes sense, although it's a pretty big extrapolation for variations on that, on that, um, on that scale. So I'm going to sort of, I guess, um, return to the question of primordial black holes because we got a few questions about them, um, lots of interest. Um, and I guess I'll just ask the simple. So how are you going to find them or what exactly is the sort of venture to finding them or where does it begin? Well, you know, so I, I didn't invent this. And, and I mean, let me back up a little bit. Um, I guess in the mid '80s, the idea that 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 um, uh, dark matter could be, you know, the stars that didn't quite make it and and collapsed into something dark, you know, a failed star uh, came up. And as a, as a general class of object, these were called massive, compact halo objects or machos. And so these were any objects that that contained significant matter, uh, you know, let's say the mass of a comet or heavier. Um, and these could just be floating around the galaxy, and we wouldn't see them. And and so there was a, a couple of really impressive experiment, experiments using a phenomenon that that Melissa mentioned, where if you could look at a bunch of stars that were outside of the galaxy. And, and one of these things came and moved in front, they would cause the star to appear bright, bright, brighter because the gravity of the star actually acts as, as a lens. And so that is kind of the classical way of, of looking for um, you know, a primordial black hole, which is, is what I'm interested in. Um, it's, 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 it's difficult uh, because the, the, the experiment the experiments that were done in the 80s and 90s um, and in the early 2000s 
we're, we're looking for heavier objects where the lensing effect was, was larger and of longer duration. So they could just look at all these stars, 5 million stars every night, and you kind of expect the brightness variation to take place over days. As they get lighter, the right brightness variation takes place over hours and then for the very lightest minutes. And there have been a, a couple of interesting measurements um, done using the trillion stars of Andromeda um, to look for this effect. So to me, that's the, the, the best bet. Uh, although I've been talking to people who study exoplanets and they can, they can make very precise measurements of the velocity of a star because of the perturbing orbit of a, of, a, of a planet orbiting around the star called an exoplanet. And um, I've I'm, I'm been working on, is there a way that you could look for a, a star that suddenly just kind of goes like that because a primordial black hole scoots by. Uh, so far, no luck. Um, black holes are tough. I love the word scoot used in relation to them. So I'm going to ask one sort of final question, which is kind of about the book itself. Um, I'm interested to sort of see where this book might kind of fall on the sort of general audience members. Um, so Lewis Friedman asked, would your book be good for someone who has never studied physics, except maybe eons ago in high school? And also asks uh, what, or someone else asked rather, like what, how did you kind of start with dark matter? Or what was the first thing you read? It's a two part question, I guess. <laughs> Oh, what was the first thing I read? Um, yeah, I had a pretty rough introduction to dark matter, actually. I was, for my PhD, I did an experiment looking for a very rare kind of decay. And I had built this detector more or less by myself. Uh, well, I mean, no, that's not fair, but I, I, I had been kind of in charge of it. And we had it um, in this, um, freeway tunnel that went through the Swiss Alps because this was very susceptible to cosmic rays. And so we used an Alp to stop cosmic rays. So this was a very, you know, from a radiation standpoint, quiet, quiet environment. So I was happily doing this experiment and I had been at it for a few years and I was living in Switzerland. My PhD advisor was Felix Bohm. He was at at Caltech, so I was unsupervised, which was great. Um, we went to a conference uh, in France in January, and I was actually writing my thesis, and a guy named David Spurgle, uh, who was an astrophysicist from Princeton, gave a talk basically saying that dark matter could be these WIMP particles, weakly interacting massive particles, and if they were, they would they would bounce off nuclei and leave a very tiny amount of energy that could be measured. And, and he said, uh, the kind of experiment that could already do this was exactly what I was doing. And, and, and so my advisor turned to me and said, oh, you have this great opportunity to do some wonderful science. I mean, I was writing my thesis, you know, I really wanted to get that done. Um, but uh, I, I uh, well, I, listen to him. Uh, so we, we made some simple modifications to that experiment and, um, and did one of the very first searches for particle dark matter and wrote a paper about it. So the, <laughs> the first paper I read was the one I was writing. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you, you know, that, 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 but my introduction was David Spurgle's papers. There was another guy uh, later on, um, uh, Mark Kamiakowski, who uh, along with a few other people wrote, wrote sort of the first big paper on, on, on dark matter. Um, and uh, the, what, what was the second question? <laughs> oh, it was uh, sort of just a, another kind of, is your book a good introduction to this subject? Oh, this introduction. Well, I, you know, I, I made a rule for myself um, when I started the book which was that I, I, I wasn't going to cut any corners and I wasn't going to dumb anything down. Um, and then the third rule was I wasn't going to use any equations. Uh, so there's some multiplication and addition, but there, there aren't any 
equations. And um, my, my hope would be that, and, and, and I also tried to explain kind of the core ideas about Newtonian gravity, because that's really the backdrop for this whole story. And, and so there's, there's about five pages that are pretty qualitative about how Newtonian gravity works. Um, and and, and the, the, the other thing I kind of realized is that when you write a popular book, you're not trying to teach people how to calculate or how to be you know, uh, professionals in the field. It's more about art appreciation and explaining something so that somebody understands it, so they feel good about understanding something rather than trying to explain everything. So um, I don't try to explain everything. Uh, I don't list every experiment, which some people are already unhappy about that. Oh, you didn't mention my experiment. Well, you know, there's like six dozen experiments. Mm -hmm. Great, so that is the, I think that's all the time we have for questions. Can I, I, can I say one oh, more please thing? please do. Mm -hmm. So if, if you would like some swag, so if we're, if we were in the bookstore, I'd have brought one of these for everyone and we'd put it together and we'd all look at it. But if, if you send me a picture of, of yourself holding my book, having bought it, I'll send you <laughs> a box of dark matter. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. <laughs> Can I get one? <laughs> I, well, okay. This is the first one. Um, that's incredible. What's a good way to reach you, Peter? I'm just kidding. Um. <laughs> oh, Fisher P at MIT.edu. Awesome. Oh, I, I will also mention that <laughs> you, you can go to um, OpenSea.io and you can buy the network fungible token for, for this box. <laughs> With dark matter. Awesome. Incredible. Yeah. Um, Great. So any, uh, well, thank you both so much. Um, just any closing thoughts before we, before we end for the evening? Well, I think, I think everybody should go to Harvard bookstore and, and buy lots and lots of books and then come up <laughs> here to Porter Square Books and get some books there because yes. you know, independent bookstores are magical. And I mean, there aren't any chains left really, are there? I mean, mm. <laughs> you know, Amazon killed everybody. But yeah. Uh, the, those are special places and, and uh, you know, help them. <laughs> awesome. Great. Great. Thanks them. so much for yeah. coming, Peter. Well, thank you, Melissa. This is, you, you set this up and uh, we, we got to get together, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, your, your, your student Elizabeth is coming by tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Great. Well, and okay. thanks to all of you out there for spending part of your evening with us. Uh, please learn more about this book and purchase What is Dark Matter on Harvard.com. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Keep reading and be well. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.